You are listening to Dove Valley Deep Divers with Eric Trickle and Lance Sanderson. Ball comes out of the hands of Newton. It's on the ground, picked up by T.J. Ward at the four-yard line. Vaughn Miller did it again. On Overtime Media. Right, just give it a moment, see if everything's all good. It looks like it's all good. Thank you guys for joining us tonight. My name is Eric Trickle, and tonight I'm going to be hosting the show. My normal colleague or partner, Lance Sanderson, is out hunting, I believe. And so joining me tonight is the one, the only, Carl Dummler. Carl, how's it going? I'm good. You know, my, my wife just texted me saying she's out at the, the deer blind getting ready to take down a deer tonight, too. So, nice. uh yeah, yeah. She was pretty pretty excited. She said she saw a lot of deer this morning. They just didn't get close enough. So we'll we'll see. We'll see who brings in a bigger deer. Of of well, Lance or my wife. I'm definitely wishing your wife luck and hopefully she gets something. And same with Lance. Hopefully hopefully he's able to limit out and be back next week. But if not, next week, not sure who'll be on, but we'll definitely have somebody on. But we definitely have a fun conversation tonight. Obviously, it's going to depend so much on if the game's actually played this week um, with everything going on with the Patriots again. But uh, we're going to be talking about how, what, what the Broncos can do offensively to help Drew Locke against Bill Belichick who and his defense that is, is so well known for just making inexperienced quarterbacks just look inexperienced. But before we get to that, we do have some matters of business. Um, first of all, make sure you guys are following us at Eric Trickle, E-R-I-C-K, T-R-I-C-K-E-L, and then at Carl Dummler, M-H-H. You can also make need to make sure that you are following the The Valley Deep Divers podcast Twitter account, and also make sure you are following the at Mile Huddle Twitter account. Make sure you also check out your huddleuppod.com. That's all of our, uh, our all of our gear, our shirts. Unfortunately, I don't have my shirt on or my hat near me or anything like that to show off, but there's definitely some cool stuff there. I think there's baby onesies, uh, that multiple shirts, hats. I'm definitely working on trying to get a tie out on there, but uh, <laughs> yeah, definitely a bunch of stuff for all. Everybody's kind of interest there. And also make sure you guys, if you guys can't support us with the, with the clothing line or subscribing or anything like that, um, make, make sure, well, subscribing financially, obviously, uh, make sure you guys subscribe on YouTube to the mile Huddle Twitter account or on iTunes or, um, let's see what else is there. Um, Spotify, I think, uh, um, all that stuff. Make sure you guys uh, subscribe there. Make sure you guys like the show and make sure you share it out. It's, it's actually kind of amazing how the word of mouth actually helps out the show. There's actually a couple people here in Alaska of all places that have come up to me and said that and started listening to the show and they recognized me either from watching it live or something. And I've mentioned that. So that a friend of theirs point them in the way of the show. In fact, one of the lawyers that I have to work with every day, he's one of them. So make sure you guys are doing that. Now, also, we are sponsored by sportsbetting.com. And tonight it's uh, Broncos country. It, I mean, as everybody knows, gambling is now illegal in the state of Colorado. And here's what makes sportsbetting.com a no-brainer for all sports fans. Sharp odds and low juice. They have in-house bookmakers. They're not third-party provider of odds. Reduced juice. Best prices. Hassle-free bonuses, one-time rollover, means the bonus money is yours after you bet it one time. Other sites range from five to 30 times. 24-7 live customer support, always a real person in the U.S. And here, here's the kicker. At sportsbetting.com slash huddle, you can get a 100% risk-free week of sports betting up to $500. Not just one bet, but all of your bets. Play for a week, and if your losses exceed your winnings at the end of the week, sportsbetting.com slash huddle will cover 100% of the difference up to $500 with a one-time rollover. So head on over to sports betting at www.sportsbetting.com slash mile high huddle. That's www.sportsbetting.com slash mile high huddle and capitalize on a risk-free week of sports betting up to $500. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Guys, everybody wants to find a way to make a difference and make an impact in the world. A lot of times people get too caught up with our lives. Things are happening. We got jobs. We got families. We got school. We got things going on. We don't always have the means to get around to doing that. But here's what's cool about Coors Seltzer. You can actually make a difference by just enjoying a great, great drink. And here's how it works. Coors Seltzer is launching the world's easiest volunteer program. By simply cracking open a can of Coors Seltzer, you're volunteering. 
because our waterways, let's face it, they're at risk. 80% of America's rivers are drying up. Through a partnership, though, with Change the Course, Coors Seltzer is helping to protect and restore America's rivers. Here's how that works. Each 12-pack of Coors Seltzer restores 500 gallons of fresh water to U.S. rivers and the communities that depend on them. The way it shakes out, 1 billion gallons of water get restored to 16 river basins across the U.S., and that's just year one. Here's what's great, though, about Coors Seltzer itself. Not only are you making a difference in the world simply by purchasing Coors Seltzer, but you also get to enjoy naturally flavored black cherry, mango, lemon lime, and grapefruit. I particularly like the black cherry, and the specs are in. Coors Seltzer is 4.5% ABV, and it's only 90 calories. As someone who covers the NFL and a giant football fan, there's nothing I like more than kicking back on a Sunday morning, getting my spread, getting my food, getting my drinks, putting on a full slate of NFL action, and kicking back with a Coors Seltzer. Whether it's a black cherry, a mango, lemon, lime, Chad, I live for football and kicking back with my Coors Seltzer each and every single game week. Amen. So join the world's easiest volunteer program, gang, by simply drinking Coors Seltzer. You can volunteer to restore America's rivers. You buy Coors Seltzer. You help restore 500 gallons of water into America's rivers. Guys, it's that simple. Who would have guessed saving the world could be that easy? Visit CoorsSeltzer.com to find Coors Seltzer near you. That's CoorsSeltzer.com. For every 12-pack sold through 831-2021, Coors will purchase services from Change the Course to restore 500 gallons of fresh river water. Details at CoorsSeltzer.com. Celebrate responsibly, Coors Brewing Company, Fort Worth, Texas. Now, Carl, I can tell you that the whole postponement of the game, all the rescheduling stuff that they had to do just absolutely drove me nuts. And there's a bunch of issues that come from it because apparently now – Draymond Jones and Demarcus Walker, they were both going to be set to come back this week, but now they can't. And now we have a question if the game's going to get postponed again, if it's going to have to add an 18th week to the season. We just don't know. But all we can do at this time is go forward and talk about the game like it's going to happen at least maybe Tuesday, maybe Sunday. We don't know yet. Right. And it, it, go ahead. And of course, the good, the best news is, is that Drew Locke is expected to come back. I think, I think he's listed as questionable on the latest injury report. Yep. And but it, it, the expectation is he's going to start. Um, basically, it's that, that's what the expectation is. They've always been looking at week six for him to come back, and it's going to be interesting to see how he is after that shoulder. It, it is. Uh, I, I will say, this is a, a probably more important game for Drew Locke to be back than I think some people realize just because of what what the Patriots like to do on defense, which we're going to talk about here tonight a little bit. Uh, Rippon is not good for the type of throws that you need to make against the Patriots to beat them. It, it, w- it would be disastrous, <laughs> to, to say the least. Uh, so I'm, I'm really happy that Drew Locke's back. Hopefully he is uh, healed up, that he's close to 100%, able to go, able to trust his arm, and and hopefully – He's cleaned a few things up over these last few weeks of just getting to sit. And, and I, it sounds like he spent a lot of time watching film of past quarterbacks that stayed healthy. What did they do? When did they learn to throw the ball away? How did they learn to be sacked? I think that, that that's actually uh, an art to the game yeah. that you need to learn. I mean, Peyton Manning always talked about that most of us, when we're about to get hit, we like to tense up because we want to brace for impact. He said the best thing you can do is actually relax your body. And that, that's tough to learn because it goes against your natural instincts. And so hopefully he's learned a few things because the Broncos absolutely need him. If they're going to get this season back on track at all, Drew Locke has to be a big part of that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, they there's still so many questions they have about him too. I mean, the six and a quarter games that he started, that's not enough to really get a concrete answer of what he is, of what he can be, of what progress he's going to be able to show, especially with the hampered off season, like, it's just it's just such a question mark, and they got to get that answered because it's this isn't something with the quarterback position where they can just kick the can down the road and continuously do that. They got to have an answer about Drew Lock now. If if they don't have it this year, then they need to be taking looking at a quarterback this year. It's just so much there, and this this really is a good game for to get him back. I mean, as you said, with Brett Ripon against his defense, it's not just that I don't think he could have made he can't make the throws that you need to make. 
I don't think he'd be able to make the reads that he needs to make pre-snap against Bill Belichick. Right. And it's just, I mean, those three interceptions he threw against the Jets, I mean, those are mistakes that against the Jets, obviously they're a terrible team led by terrible coaching, but that's a whole different story is you can't make those mistakes against Bill Belichick. doesn't matter who's that quarterback. doesn't matter what they have on offense. You can't make those mistakes because they will make you pay for it one way or, or one way or another. They're going to make you pay for it. Right. Yeah, they, they are. Uh, and they don't have as incompetent of an offense that you can get away with being negative three in the turnover co- column and still beat them. Belichick seems, I mean, they, they thrive on you making mistakes to beat yourself. They are just the the most well coached team in, in the NFL almost every single season, and a big part of that is is he just emphasizes this: we are not going to be the team that loses. We're going to let them beat themselves, and so yeah, it, it's that's why he plays a lot of close games. It's why Tom Brady making a lot of those comebacks, being there in the fourth quarter, uh, that that set it up because they just again they didn't hurt themselves, and uh, so. Good thing to have Drew Locke back. Like I said, just being able to make some throws uh, that, that are going to be needed. The, the Patriots are known for playing a cover one defense. They played it last season, more snaps than any other team in the NFL. And they also were ranked as the number one cover one defense in it, the NFL last year when they played those snaps. Um, and part of why they do that, it, it's amazing. <sighs> Belichick does not get enough credit. Honestly, even though a lot of people talk about how he is possibly the best coach in NFL history, I think sometimes they, they miss what he brings to the table. And, and it really is just the, the genius of his defenses. And, and it's not so much that he has to change going from uh, one quarterback to the next. I mean, they do change up little things here and there. But for the most part, they like this cover one defense that takes away the middle of the field. That's why I'm saying Brett Rippon is not a good quarterback for this game because that's where Brett Rippon can do well. Look at all of his interceptions. They were to the outside other than the the tipped interception one. Um, He can't make those throws to the outside. That's how you have to beat this kind of defense. The the Patriots want to funnel you to the the middle. And that one, I mean, that touchdown pass to Jerry Judy, that was another outside pass that that was really underthrown. And if it's not for Jerry Judy, that's another interception. Yeah. So it's not I, I, not trying to hamper on Brett Rippon. I think he can be a quality backup quarterback in the yeah. NFL. It's just a matter of that he's very limited with what you can do for him. And against the Patriots, you can't you you can't win with him against a team like the Patriots. Yeah. You just can't. Not just because of them for wanting to. Um, uh, taking care of the middle, not just because of that, just because of everything that Bill Belichick's going to throw at him with with different looks, but running that cover one and just all these different things. And it's, I mean, you you said it that Bill Belichick he doesn't get enough um, credit for it what so for what he does, despite being the best coach in my opinion in NFL yeah. history, because that defense continuously plays at a high level even when they're lacking talent, because that scheme just brings the best out of them. And real quick, I mean, Kenneth, I understand what a 50-50 ball is. That wasn't a 50-50 ball. That was an <laughs> underthrown pass. Yeah. And if you watch it, Jerry, he's the actual pass would be to lead Jerry Judy on that. It's a deep shot. Jerry Judy has to adjust and make that catch, which is what turns it into a 50-50 ball when it really wasn't. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of things that they can do to help out Drew Locke. And last week I talked about it a little bit. And one thing is motion. Denver is towards the bottom. I think they're 22nd in their usage of usage of pre-snap motion. And that is one thing that I definitely think that it can help out any quarterback, and especially inexperienced, because it gives you a lot of information pre-snap just by who's covering who, what type of defense and everything. I mean, going in, obviously, you know, it's going to be a lot of cover one, but any extra information you can get from a pre-snap motion benefits your quarterback. Right. Yeah, you're right. I did want to get to this. What I mean by Belichick not getting enough credit, he gets enough credit for his teams winning championships and getting them ready for championships. I don't think he gets enough credit for the genius of his defense. Yeah. I mean, you look at the the top two teams of the, the NFL and then, of course, college football with Nick Saban. Both these guys say cover one is the best defense that you can play in, in football. 
That's what they tell high school coaches. That's what they tell college coaches uh, because they, they see just the, the ability, like I said, to, to take away the easy throws in the middle and force a quarterback to have to be accurate to the outside. And some quarterbacks can do that great, but it, there's, it begins to limit the number of quarterbacks that can beat you in that way. Yep. And if you play a very disciplined defense, it works well. And so, like I said, it just – his genius behind that kind of defense, especially in today's modern NFL, and and the, the fact that he can plug and play players. They, they were doing this before Stephon Gilmore got there. Now, it helps to have a guy like Stephon, Stephon Gilmore, but they could still do it without him because they, they just have a defense that's designed to to plug and play players that are just smart on the field and and just stay disciplined to what they do. It's why that linebacker, and I don't know why I'm spacing his name that they got rid of not too long ago, who was an athletic freak, but he kept trying to, um, oh, he's there back in 2015 because the Broncos picked on him because he was trying to do too much. But anyway, if somebody knows who I'm talking about, you guys can can let me know. But uh, anyway, when you have a guy that's kind of doing his own rogue thing, that destroys that defense. Yeah. So they can have 11 average players, but if they're all doing their job, it becomes an elite defense. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Yeah, and that's, in, in a way, that's actually a little bit similar to Vic Fangio's defense, not the cover one or anything like that, but it relies on everybody doing their job and doing it correctly. There's no room for freelancing, and a lot of defenses are that way, is that there's just not room for freelancing. And Bill Belichick, I mean, he makes it clear he doesn't put up with it. On offense or defense, you run the play that's called as it's called, or you're not going to be there for for very long. Right. And Jamie Collins, that's who I was thinking about. Yeah. And um, one one other thing that could be beneficial is having Noah Fant back because I because he's just such a, a mismatch against this Patriots defense. I mean, those safeties that they have though that that's that is a little bit concerning, but. They're linebackers. They're solid guys. Um, I'm trying to think who their line, starting linebackers are off the top of my head, um, but they're all they're all people that not not the worst matchups for Noah Fant to go against. I mean, it's definitely an ability uh, matchup where the Broncos offense they can take advantage of that. So that that that's another way, at least in my opinion, that I think that the Broncos can help out Drew Locke is hopefully Noah Fant plays and able to find him on the favorable matchups for the Broncos. So linebackers wise, they have uh, it's uh, Juwan Bentley, Brandon Copeland, uh, John Simon, kind of depending on, and then Chase Winovich because they kind of rotate those guys going back and forth. Ed. I know some people get mad about Vic Fangio sending his outside linebackers back in coverage. It's just part of the NFL today. That's yeah. what they do. And it's definitely going to be interesting. I think Chase Winovich, he's he's a very underrated edge rusher. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be interesting to see how the Broncos handle him. Garrett Bowles, he's been playing at a really high level all season long. So it's going to be uh, kind of going to be curious to see if he's able to continue that trend after so long away from the game. I mean, what, it was 17 days since their last game if they play on Sunday? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's going to be interesting if that time away doesn't hurt Garrett Bowles or if maybe he's able to make it and take that play a little bit better. It's definitely nice. I, I saw somebody mention there about having consistency with the coaching staff and asked Garrett Bowles about it with how it could help Drew Locke. And that is a spot on comment is having the consistent coach, coaching for a guy like Garrett Bowles who came into the NFL very raw is so crucial to being able to develop him because you're not having different coaches teaching him a little bit of different technique, which was a big issue for him. I mean, one guy's teaching him to do things this way. Another guy's teaching him to do things this way. Then you get Mike Munchak in, who he's doing it a completely different way. You can't have that fourth guy. So definitely Garrett Bowles is a good testament to that comment that was made earlier. Yep. Yeah, it, it's true. You, you learn something one way over and over again for years. You're going to be better at it than having to change it up little by little yeah. as, as you go. Uh, so I'm hoping, you know, Pat Shermer is a guy that can stick around for a little while. I, I know a lot of people are upset with the offense not doing great so far. But I don't think it's been as much about Pat Shermer not calling a good game. Yeah. I, I, yes, there's some plays that I disagree with what he's done, but that's going to be any offensive coach, even the best offensive coaches out there. Because hindsight's twenty twenty. It's like, come on, yeah. what, what were you thinking there? <laughs> uh, but, just, just on your point, though, is especially recently, I've seen a lot of people complaining about Kyle Shanahan's 
play calling for the for the 49ers and he's considered one of the best offensive minds i see complaints about um mcveigh weekly and these are really good offensive minds in the nfl so you're spot on it doesn't any coach they're all there's always going to be plays you disagree with yeah and to have the second string quarterback who is not even worth being a backup, he's probably going to be off the team pretty soon. And Driscoll, yeah. and then of course Rippin as well. It begins to really limit what you can do, and especially with the shortened off season. It just again, the, everybody's still learning this offense, so yeah. it, it's just going to take some time. I, I would rather judge how this offense looks over the last eight weeks of the season than the first eight, just because, like I said, it's just going to. I think you're going to start seeing things click a lot more once that begins to happen, and guys get healthy. That's going to help too. Yep. And actually on that note is one player I'm actually really curious to see going forward. And it's a player who he was actually my week five um, rookie to watch, but then the game got postponed, but uh, is Lloyd Cushenberry with his extended time off. How is he able to develop as just in this short time? Because Denver really needs him to step up. He's part of what's making the calls on the line and he's struggling there. He's just not holding up his blocks. And, I mean, Dalton Reisner, Graham Glasgow, they're having their issues as well, but it's all starting in the middle and fading out. So they right. definitely need to step up. And, it, it, again, it's, it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, he came in with being a smart player, high pedigree for, for how intelligent of a player he is, just technical issues. I mean, last year at LSU, he really struggled with giving up pressure. And there was no offseason, really, for him to learn this offense and adapt. He had to do a lot of it on his own. And so, I mean, this extended time off, a uh, good way to see see how much they've been able to get through to him. Yeah. Well, I thought we'd get to David Kilgore's super chat here. Uh, so you guys think they will move the game again since the Pats have another positive? I, I don't think they will. Honestly, I think last, last week, if it wasn't Cam Newton and Stefan Gilmore – I don't think the Pats push as hard to move the game. Yeah. I, I, from what I understand, it was the Pats that told the NFL, we are not playing this game, not the NFL telling the Pats we're not playing this game. And since they got those two guys back, I think they're going to be okay. I think the NFL realizes one, they're in a huge bind. They can't push this game unless they decide, okay, we're going to scrap everything that we said before. We're adding our 18th week, but even there, you're you're putting the Broncos into a very dangerous situation for being at that point it would be 24 days off between games. I I can't see that being a good. I mean, yes, you get some guys healthy, but then all of a sudden going from no hitting to hitting with teams that have been hitting for a long time and just I, yeah, that can't be a good thing for the Broncos. Um, and so I, I just think this game's going to end up happening on Sunday. Sunday, I mean, I, I could see Monday just because the Chiefs are playing on they're playing on Monday, right? Yeah, I could see them make that kind of decision, but I, I still think it'll be Sunday. Yeah, if it gets postponed, I could see it Monday. I could see it being pushed for Tuesday, but let's hope it's not Tuesday because that gives them for a short week to prefer, prepare for the Chiefs. Um, I think in the end, they'll take what precautions they can, and we'll see this game played on Sunday. If not, they'll postpone it, put in a Week 18, do everything that they've already been talking about doing with the playoffs. I mean, they're basically doing it with the Pro Bowl anyway, so... Just doing all that and then throwing in that that uh, 18th week in here. Brian Greenfield comes in with a $5 donation. Thank you, Brian. He says, Elway's never lost a game to New England in his career. Is that true? I think I think it is. I'm pretty sure I've seen that stat before. If anything, he maybe lost one game, but it also just shows, especially the, the Shanahan system, is one of the best to attack the uh, the Patriot defense. Just because, again, when you got that kind of uh, that play action game going, that bootleg where it forces that safety and that middle linebacker that's in the middle of the field to have to make a decision of is this a run play or is this a a pass play? Uh, It allows and then getting the quarterback out of the pocket. That's another thing that they can do for Drew Locke in this kind of game. Uh, Just give him half a field to have to read. And I mean, it just simplifies things a little bit, but also then. Again, gives him a little bit more time for guys to get open. I all that kind of plays into to how you help uh, Drew Locke in this one. You know, play it a little bit like what Shanahan and Elway did all those years, and uh, even then after that. I mean, if you look at some of the best quarterbacks against uh, the Patriots, 
Jake Plummer had a good career against him. I think Brian Greasy had a good career against him, if I remember right. So that, that kind of system really sets up well. And I, I think the Broncos should take a few things from that, at least for this game. I definitely agree with that. Now I'll get into some questions we have in the chat. Miller 707 champ said, should Denver trade Justin Simmons? Also, what is he worth? I don't want to trade him, but I strongly feel he won't be back next year. So we should get something for him while we can. Well, before we get into the question, I've always maintained that the sense I get was that the Broncos, at the very least, they would be bringing um, Justin Simmons back on another franchise tag. But with Garrett Bowles doing as well as he is, and I understand they're trying to get a deal done with him now, or at least getting ready to start talks with him, it's going to be interesting to see because that's another player that they can sit there and franchise tag and then let Justin Simmons walk. So it's a, a lot of discussions. Now, as for if they should trade him, it really depends on how the next few weeks go right before yeah. the deadline does. If they if they walk away with are at that point with what a one in five record or possibly one in six, depending on what happens with the Patriots game, then you you got to shop them at least. You you set a high price. You call people teams that are contending. I know there's a few teams out there that they could use a little bit of extra help in their secondary, primarily at safety, that are right now undefeated. Um, so you sit there and you try to get them to bite on that to give up the picks, kind of sell out a little bit of the future to help them win now. Um, And I think at the very least, he would probably bring back two second round picks. It would be, would be, would be the minimum. I think I'd be looking at. Right. Well, I mean, you you always have to start with, if we keep him and he signs somewhere else, they're going to get a third round comp pick. So it has. So then it comes down to second round pick. And then usually you like to kind of stack those to get a couple drafts worth of, of picks from, from a player like him. Uh, but you're right. It kind of depends on how the next couple games go. If the Broncos get themselves right back into this by beating the Patriots, because that'll be a team that'll be in that fight for those last couple playoff spots, uh, then you feel pretty good. If Drew Locke starts looking pretty good, if you somehow sneak one past the Chiefs, we'll, we'll see. You never know. Uh, then, yeah, you can start really thinking about that you have to keep people, and then all of a sudden maybe you you become a little bit of a buyer. But uh, right now, I mean, it really is. Two games can really change the outlook of this season. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Yeah, definitely. And that's actually is a really good question because I just actually submitted an article about the trade deadline and four different scenarios the Broncos need to be con- con- talking about right now with what it comes to them doing. I mean, both of the scenarios are them not doing so well at the buy, being that one in five, one in six, and looking to sell high players or buy low on younger players that aren't doing well with the current teams, guys they could possibly take to build up for the future. And then, of course, they start doing well, selling off dead weight that they have on the roster while looking to buy players that are that could really help them out. So definitely keep an eye out for that. It's probably going to go up either later tonight or tomorrow. Now, another question is from John on Facebook, and he says, E-Trick, let's talk about your early mock. Edge in round one. Come on, man. I usually agree with you, but, man, we got more needs at tackle, cornerback, and safety, and inside linebacker. Now, to be clear, whenever I do a mock draft this early, or any mock draft, really, it's always with the format of using a simulator to simulate every other team's picks. Right. And when it came to the Broncos being on the board at – Number eight, um, Micah Parsons was gone. Dylan Moses was gone. There's another line, not another linebacker I value top 10. Safety, there's not one I value top 10. Uh, tackle, there's only one I value top 10 right now. The rest, I think, would probably about that 15 to 25 range for the next group. And then cornerback, I really, I really thought about Caleb Far- uh, Farley out of mm-hmm. what, Virginia Tech, right? Or Virginia? Virginia Tech. Okay. Yeah. I, I really thought about him, but with him opting out, I'm a little uncertain. Patrick Sertain, I don't like his fit in the scheme, so I didn't go his way. And the GOAT, the greatest of all cornerbacks in the class, Sean Wade, uh, as much as I like him and a big fan of him, he's not my number one corner, and I think that would have been a little bit early. So at this point, I went with the second most valuable position in the NFL. That's Ed Rusher. And the reasoning for it is Von Miller's older. Von Miller's coming back from a major injury. Von Miller is expensive and Denver can get out of his deal easily after this year. And if they don't, then he's a free agent after the 2021 season and they can have Gregory Rousseau 
right there behind him, developing, learning from Von Miller to be able to take over after the 2021 season. It's a very similar to move to what the Broncos did when they drafted Shane, uh, Shane Ray, when they had DeMarcus Ware and Von Miller. And even Nick Kendall, actually, he's talked about this a couple times on Twitter, is that the ages of all the players involved are actually quite similar. So I understand that there was more needs, but I also am not one to draft by need. I try to do needs at a BPA. And I think edge is a much bigger need than many other people. It, it's actually higher for me than cornerback, safety, and inside linebacker. Well, and I think you also have to factor in uh, Bradley Chubb now has – well, he's torn his ACL two times or three times? Uh, at, at least twice. Yeah, at least twice, <laughs> which is not good. <laughs> Whether the number's two or three, it's not good. Um, and he, let's say he starts playing – to the level, I mean, he had a great game this last game against the Jets. Plays at the level that you want him to be played at. Uh, he's going to be up for that next big contract, but you want to keep the edge group strong. So you need, you always need to be cycling in new players to take over and, and do those things. Uh, and, and I'm with you. If some of those guys like Micah Parsons, Dylan Moses are gone, you know, at, at, at a position that is a true need and can fit value, then you start looking at who is just the most valuable player. And it, it, edge obviously skyrockets to the top. So I, I don't blame you one bit for, for going in that direction. And like you said, I think it is a bigger need than we realize. I mean, Von Miller's gone down, and the Broncos have had to supplement their pass rush by bringing their, their, lineback- their off-ball linebackers on blitzes over and over again yeah. because they can't get pressure with just four. And that, that's, a, that's a huge deal. And I'm trying to remember the stat. But I mean, Malik Reed, Jeremiah Tauchu, I mean, I guess I guess they're solid, but they're not really performing that well this year. I mean, Jeremiah Tauchu, he's mm-hmm. been doing really well when he's asked to drop back in coverage. He's been doing well as a run defender, but as a pass rusher, they're just not living up to it. And I saw somewhere like they have a com- they have like ten all the backup edge rushers have less than ten total combined pressures, and I'm, I'm double checking to make sure that's correct. I know it's not a lot, but it's something that. Yeah, it's very concerning. So you got it. You have to improve that. And I mean, heck, if if you get Gregory Rousseau and you have this three man rush, you're able to keep Von Miller a little bit fresher. You're able to keep Bradley Chubb a little bit fresher. Right. And being able to consistently rotate these guys to help get after the quarterback. Right. And yeah, after just looking up, there's nine total pressures between the four backup edge rushers with six of them to Jeremiah Tauchu and three of them to Malik Reed. And I'm pretty sure Bradley Chubb had 10 pressures in the last game alone. Yeah. So (laughs) that's just showing the difference in talent on each side there. And, uh, you know, I I like Caleb Farley, but you're right. There's a lot of risk that comes with that of him skipping an entire year of football and asking him to step in. Especially with the medical history he has. Right. It's kind of extensive there. Right. And, you know, even some of the other positions, I know a lot of people are still looking at tackle, but I'm really hoping they bring back Bowles. He's really starting to live up to to the hype and knows the system uh, and fits the team well. And he, he he's I mean, I know a lot of people talk about some of the dumb things he's done uh, on the field and rightfully so. He's yeah. got to learn to clean up some of those things, but he's, he's showing better signs as we go. But he's also a guy that fights for your team. I mean, you saw that fire after the Jets game, man. I, I think if uh, if Fangio wasn't there, he would have went and killed somebody. Uh, and so we'd be having a different conversation right now. <laughs> I mean, I maintain that in that Jets game, I can't remember the linebacker. Now, was it? I think it was it Alec Ogletree, the one who came up and just shoved Bulls right to the ground <clears throat> after the play was done. Whatever linebacker was yeah. who shoved him, I thought for sure that Bulls was going to kill him on the next play. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, Bulls is kind of a hothead. It's got him into trouble a little bit in high school and stuff like that. And it's right. why his, uh, his his background is, a, is is very rough for him. So it's a it's a little bit – it was a little bit nice on my part to see him keep his cool completely and right. not react in a bad way. Right. But I, I and, say all that in that I want the Broncos to re-sign him. Yeah. And, of course – Juwan James is going to be back next year. You can say whatever you want about how good or bad that's going to be. But uh, tackle-wise, they, they could be set at tackle before the draft. Now, it doesn't mean they don't go and draft somebody. But I don't know if you use a first-round pick on a guy to sit for a year or two waiting for Juwan James to leave. Yeah, and in my mock draft, I had Daniel Fa'alele, 
who is a six foot nine, four hundred pound beast at right tackle that could definitely sit for a year and develop if Jawan James is able to play the full year, which I won't hold my breath for that. But if he's needed, it's a guy who he improves your depth. He can come in and play, get that experience to help him grow and develop. And yeah. plus, who knows what they have in Calvin Anderson? This is a coaching staff that really raves about what he brings and what he offers up. So he's a guy that they're looking at that could possibly be their future right tackle. So I think that I think right I think tackle in general is a little bit better off than a lot of fans do. I still think it's a need, right? And the biggest reason for me it's a need is because while they rave about Calvin Anderson, until I see it, it they need help. Like right. they need depth more than anything, at least. Right? Now. No, I'm, I and I'm with you on that. I just. You know, most people, the the starter side of it was because everybody thought Garrett Bowles was going to continue to be a bust. Now he's kind of gone the opposite direction of that. And if you can get him re-signed, then yeah, tackle. Yes. Right. Um, (laughs) We we shall see. But uh, I'm very impressed with what he's brought so far. And he seems to be showing some different things than he did last year. I think that's the the big thing is, is he's always been an athletic freak for a tackle. And he's always had some nice blocks throughout a season. But now he's actually showing some proper technique and what he's bringing to the table. Yeah, and I absolutely love the fact that Mike Munchak, one of the things he taught him was to use what he does <laughs> and just develop that into this, the um, trap technique that he uses so often. And, I mean, in one, the one penalty that he called again in, what was it, week three? Week four for holding. I can't remember what week it was. It was on the it was on a run play. was was picture perfect trap technique and it got called for holding which is a shame because it shouldn't have been it it was just really good technique and i mean the nfl officials more and more they're having that issue of determining what's good technique and what's actually holding mitchell schwartz actually got called for holding this last week um because of him doing excellent technique his brother jeff schwartz actually broke down the play and watching it and i actually learned something from that jeff schwartz is a great person to follow on twitter to help you learn offensive line stuff Mm-hmm. Um, among among the many on there. But uh, anyways, John, thanks for the question. I really appreciate that. Sim- uh, partially because it gets me to talk about my mock draft that I did and just the draft in general, which is my thing as I'm the senior draft analyst for MiloHeddle.com. And I love the draft. Live, eat, breathe, sleep. I mean, my wife a few times has woken me up because I've had my draft notebook open up next to me and fallen asleep <laughs> writing. Um, absolutely love it. And real quick, before we move on, um, James Campbell actually makes a point about why I think that inside linebackers not as big of a need is they really like Justin Chernod. They like what he can bring. They like what he, what he offers up. And he was going to have a big role this year before he got hurt. I think they're still kind of betting on that for next year. I think they'll add a linebacker at some point. I know Elway doesn't value linebackers. And I think it, if they do, it'll probably be somewhere like late day two, early day three at the earliest. And somebody that just more so compete – with Josie Jewell instead of competing with Justin Strenod. Right. It, that, that will be an interesting debate just because Vic Fangio is a guy that values linebacker. Yeah. I mean, you look at his time with the 49ers, he had two absolute studs. Obviously, he used the top 10 pick in Chicago on a, a linebacker when he was a defensive yeah. coordinator. And, uh, and they spent big on getting uh, Danny Trevathan as well. So uh, he seems to devalue them. Elway, yeah, he's kind of uh, – Elway's always drafted, especially on the defensive side, of guys that scared him. Yeah. Linebackers didn't seem to ever scare him. Yeah. So <laughs> kind of the way it goes. And I, I love this. Uh, Geo coming in, at all costs, we must sign Bulls. It is crazy to see us go in in just a few games from why is Bulls still on this team – to all of a sudden we must resign him. Uh, just, I mean, and it just shows what he's been able to do. And it shows also just in the NFL, sometimes it just really does take a while for a player to have it click. And once it does, then it's great. But to have that patience is sometimes tough to do. And I know some people say, well, then why can't we show patience with Drew Locke? Well, I mean, he's still got 12 more games to prove something. And then we can have more of a conversation of where things are at at that point. Uh, and, and then, and, and on that note is Drew Locke coming to the NFL didn't have just three years of football experience like Garrett Bowles did. Right. I mean, Garrett Bowles needed to be taught the game of football and then start learning the technique. And it was just a little bit too much to start, overwhelmed him a little bit. And with his learning disability and everything like that, just made things more difficult. 
And I got to say, the best thing the best thing of all of it about Garrett Bowles stepping up is I can talk about him on Dove Valley Deep Divers without getting ridiculed by the chat. <laughs> Gotta, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we no longer have to have a silence on his name or we yeah. can't say his name. Have to, to figure out ways to talk about it. Right. Yes. No. Glad to <laughs> really glad to see him figure things out. Cause like I said, he's got a, he's got an interesting backstory of how he's gotten to the NFL yeah. And uh, so always cheering for him to to have success, even if it's not with the Broncos moving forward. But uh, it, it's anyway, I, I thought we'd get back to a little bit of the, the Drew Locke discussion. Um, something I, I wanted to ask you about. What What is it that you need to see from Drew Locke over these next 12 games to make you at least give him 2021? Oh, a lot, really. And it's it's not like. Outside of a couple things, a lot of it is just doing better at what he does all right at the moment. I'd like to like I'd like to see him do better at protecting himself with getting the ball out quicker or I mean what we were talking about earlier with not tensing up when he's getting hits, things like that. Obviously I wanna see him I wanna see him hit those deep balls. Like he's touted for his having a really good arm, being able to throw it deep and everything like that, but he's gotta be able to hit those. Um, I like to see him make more pre-snap reads and adjustments pre-snap as well. And it's just, it, it really is. It's just a little bit of everything, just doing it a little bit better. And the biggest thing for me is I want to see him finish out the season. I don't want to see him get hurt again. I don't want to see him miss any more games. If he does, I'm done with him. Like, and I, I know that's harsh, but this is a guy who in six and a half games as a starter, I mean, he's had one injury in that time and he missed a lot of last season with a thumb injury that he had in, what, the second preseason game or third preseason game? I think it was the second. I can't remember because the Hall of Fame game has me yeah. thrown off for last year. Right. So in just about in about 10 games, 9, 10 games, two major injuries, that's not a good look. Got to be able to stay healthy. And another reason why, too, is if he doesn't, is Denver's probably only going to win like three or four games. They're going to be in prime position for Justin Fields, Trevor Lawrence, a little bit early for Trey Lance at the moment, but they'll be in, in a spot where they can get one of the better quarterbacks out of this class. Right, right. And, and you have to look at the AFC West. I saw somebody earlier say that the, the Broncos have the, not the worst situation, but the most unknown situation at quarterback in the AFC West. And that's not the place you want to be. And so if there is a chance to get a guy that you can get locked into a rookie contract for five years, and can be your starter, be that long-term answer, then you, you go that direction. And I, I don't want that. I, I don't want Drew Locke to fail. I don't want to have to start all over at the quarterback position. Yeah. Just because we talk about it, because we're, we're looking at all angles of the future of the team, doesn't mean we actually want it. I, I yeah, hope I w- Drew Locke proves to be the guy. That that would be the, the best thing for this franchise. I, I, I want him to go out there. I want him to ball. I want him to do well. And I want I want him to be the future. I mean, not just because of I mean, him being the future helps out the Broncos. It, not just because it keeps them from um, having to start another rebuild, trying to find another quarterback, but because despite what I know, a lot of people don't think think this isn't true. I don't want I don't root for players to fail. I right. don't I, I just don't I don't want Drew Lock to fail. I want him to be successful. I want every player the Broncos draft to go out there and be successful. It's just not plausible. Right. So. I hope it is. And I do got to say the team that actually has the worst quarterback situation in the AFC West is the chargers. Cause not only do they have to face the other team, they have to face the medical staff. <laughs> I still, I, I feel like that he should be able to have a lawsuit against them for it's, that. Kind. I know they can't, I know that the, that's yeah, written it's, into the CBA and all that, should, but man, that is terrible. And it should make you feel they, better about the, the Broncos <laughs> medical staff. At least we haven't stabbed someone's lung. <laughs> It, it, it's just it's super annoying that rule that as soon as they accept medical help from the team, they can't hold them accountable for it. I think that's so stupid. I mean, here he is. I mean, his career, his life. I mean, that was all put at danger, and he, he can't do anything against the Chargers for it. Like, yeah, it, it's. I mean, at the very if he comes back, he's perfectly fine. And everything. Congratulations, you're no longer the starter. You lost your positions because that idiot in the medical staff managed to puncture your lung. Blame him. Right. Yeah. It, it's, 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 it's just stupid. It really is. And uh, it, I mean, the Chargers have been that way for a long time. It's why whenever <laughs> people talk about 
uh, that uh, every year, you know, the Chargers have this, oh, they're so talented. Well, they're going to lose half their team because their medical staff doesn't always know what they're doing. <laughs> and, and it yeah. seriously does. It goes back to the late 90s. I mean, I know he's on Twitter now, but um, Dr. Chow. Yeah. Um, is there's a long laundry list of issues that he had back in the late nineties and early two thousands. And real quick is Madung is, I don't think that the chargers actually are the worst thing in the AFC with the quarterback situation. I just was saying that to make the joke about them having to face the medical staff. Right. Right. I would, I'd actually probably say that the chargers are in the second best really just because of what Herbert's shown, but he's got to be able to keep that up. Right. I mean, Derek Carr, we know what he is at this point. The unknown of what Justin Herbert can be, that that, that kind of boosts, boosts him up a little bit, right? And and I think I think some people talking about this resurgence in Carr this year. One, I think the the talent around him is vastly improved from the last couple of years, and he is showing that he is a quarterback that when he has talent around him can be a very successful quarterback in the NFL. But if yeah. you ask him to do it by himself, he's not going to be able to do that. Yeah. He's going to to really struggle, especially if he doesn't have a great offensive line that makes him feel comfortable. He's going to struggle. So and, there, there's and, there's some limitations there. And talking about offensive tackles that have just taken an astronomical step forward, Colton Miller, man, he's really been looking good for the Raiders, and that bothers me. Like I, I wanted was, so badly to, to make fun of the Raiders for being idiots for passing up Derwin James. With all the time that Derwin James has missed and Colton Miller stepping up, it's almost like it makes them look smart. I know. Which, is, which and, is, is terrible. And he was average at best in college, too. Oh, yeah. He, he like he, he mean, got drafted as high as he did because of this tremendous upside, but it was just such a long shot for him to get there. But hats off to their offensive, ta- offensive line coach because they're getting him there. And with that is they also – Henry Ruggs, they drafted him. I know he's missed a couple of games. But that offense is light and days better – Night and days, not light and days. Better <laughs> <laughs> with him out there on the field. I saw the numbers for it just the other day, and my, my boss is a, is a Raiders fan, and so I was telling him about it. And their EPA is like almost two and a half points higher when Henry Ruggs is out there on the field. And just just to toot my own horn, own horn here a little bit and go back to pre draft is that is one of the big reasons why I was an advocate for um, Henry Ruggs is because his speed offers the opens up so much for the for the whole offense and it'd be nice i know kj hamler he's got really good speed it'd be nice to see them start utilizing that a little bit more when he's healthy and i know hamstrings can be very limiting so hopefully he's able to get back over that and get back to this offense real quick all right tom coming in here with a great super chat really appreciate it and uh chase claypool being a fellow canadian like myself was chosen after hamler do you guys think we missed out on that pick? Could have imagined Chase on the left side and Sutton on the right. What a duo that would would have been. Uh, I think Sutton would have been on the left, Chase on the right. Yeah, more likely in, in this this scenario. Um, now they do rotate them around, but just in in the basic situation, that's kind of how it'd be set up. Um, hindsight's twenty twenty. I mean, Hamler hasn't had a chance to really show what he brings to the field. He had his one game that he really showed well, that he showed that he can be a huge playmaker for this offense. I think it was – was it the second game? Was that against Pittsburgh that yeah. he came in and, and looked really good? And I think I even said he looks better than Jerry Judy in this game. That, yeah. That's one game. It's a very small sample size. Keep that in mind. But, uh, yeah, he's, he's got to prove that he's got to stay healthy. I mean, your availability is, is huge in the NFL. You can have great games, and and it's kind of like Drew Locke. You can have some great games, his game against Houston, but if he can't stay healthy, he can't be the future. Yeah, and and so that's the the, the problem that you see there. And, and yeah, Claypool has had a a great start to the NFL, but he's also in a very good situation as well of where he's at and who he's surrounded by to, to open things up. Um, so I, I'm not gonna close the book and say they should have taken him over Hamler yet because I still think Hamler can be a huge playmaker for this offense. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. And I'm going to I'm going to tell on myself here a little bit in pre-draft, I was one of those guys that kind of thought that Chase Claypool would be a little bit better in a Darren Waller type role. Um bulking up a little bit more and kind of playing that move tight end 
I, I really thought he could do there, do exceptionally well there, even with his, especially with his speed. I mean, that'd be just that size and that speed combination at tight end would be outstanding. And I mean, he he's living it out at wide receiver with Pittsburgh. They're using him correctly, and Pittsburgh is. If you're a receiver and you get to Pittsburgh, you're likely going to be a success because even James Washington, who's not seeing much time, he's a solid receiver for them when they call on him. Um, Deontay Johnson, a guy who I absolutely love pre-draft, he's absolutely been killing it for them. Juju Smith-Schuster, like all these receivers th- for years. Yep. Like that that receiver coach, that offense, like everything just does so well with them. It's just Oh, it's just a, it, it, it's just great to watch, and I'm glad that Claypool is doing well. Glad to right. be proven wrong on that. So right, yeah, and and I just want to say with this, did not miss games at Notre Dame and much better hands than KJ and Judy. I mean, he did have better hands. I'm not going to argue that one bit. But th- there's what KJ and Judy bring to the table. There's things that Claypool cannot do with that quick yeah. route running, the ability to get open in a hurry. That that's not exactly his game. Yeah, he's a, he's a long speed guy that he can get down the field. And uh, like you said, Darren Waller is kind of the direction I was looking as well. Just a guy that's a huge mismatch against linebackers and safeties. I just questioned a little bit of his ability just to be a full time wide receiver. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I'm glad to be proven wrong on some of that as well. Uh, I, I still like I said, I want to see what happens when the Broncos can actually get Sutton, Judy and Hamler on the field at the same time with Noah Fant. Yeah, and and something that you and I we've talked about on Twitter a couple times before too is that just because Claypool's being successful with the with the Steelers doesn't mean if the Broncos drafted him he'd be successful with them. Right. Scheme matters a lot, and I think the scheme that the Steelers run is perfect for him. I don't think he would have been as good of a fit in Pat Shermer's scheme. I think that it with cal- adding that into everything, I definitely think that Judy and Hamler are better fits for the scheme. Obviously, we have a lot to see to play out. I mean, it's only been four games for Ju- for Judy, what two and a half for Hamler and Clay and Claypool. I mean, like, hey man, gotta give him credit where credits due. He's been killing yeah. it for them, but right. But you right. don't I know mean, if he'd be doing the same thing in Denver. Right. Well, and you're talking about Brett Rippin compared to Ben Roethlisberger. Yeah, we're talking about a, a Hall of Fame quarterback compared to a guy that's going to be a career backup throwing to him. Uh, and, and a guy that's not got the greatest deep ball compared to Ben Roethlisberger, that that's a big part of his game is the deep ball. So you're, you're right. It's not, uh, it's not a plug and play kind of situation here uh, between the two situations. So it, 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 there's plenty of time to play this all out. Yeah. Tom, we, we really appreciate that question and the donation. Yeah. It, was a, it was a really great question. Yeah, it really is. Uh, and Dungus, uh, I wanted to answer his real quick just because he's in here late. Uh, if there's more positive tests, I don't know. I, I really don't know what they're going to do. This is that. This is the unknown of the NFL today. Make them forfeit. <laughs> <laughs> really, I mean, at some point you have to make a choice because you can't just keep pushing these games back and and expecting things are going to work out in the end. There, there's a point that you just have to say we're done with this. Yeah. And I mean, we talked about it in our, we have a private chat and I was talking to Carl about this and I actually said it there is more so with the Titans than the Patriots, at least until we figure out where these, what's causing these positive tests is that the NFL, they really got to come down and hand out these punishments on, on the Titans, especially because they broke protocol. They were supposed to go home and not do anything. And the players got together anyways, and the spread just continued. Like yeah. the players that were there, they need to be fined a, find what I said, 10,000. Uh, five or ten thousand for each practice that they miss, each player, or, or they got together for, should be fine for that. The team should be fined for it. I think that the team should be forfeiting draft picks. I think that for each infraction, you start up with the fourth round pick. With each infraction, it moves up one. So you go from a fourth with one first infraction, second infraction, it goes to a third, then a second, then a first. And if you get to that first, you start over again, fourth, third, second, and just keep losing draft picks as long as they keep breaking these protocols, because it's not just affecting them and not even talking about everything that comes with that, all the illness and putting everybody at risk at that. It's just, it's so unfair to these other players. Um, We saw Shelby Harris. He came out and spoke out against it about how Denver gets punished because the game gets postponed. They practiced that week. They didn't get a real bye week and then their game gets postponed. 
Um, one of the Steelers players, they had their bye week changed, and now he's missing his kid's birthday. These players, they make plans for their bye weeks, and now they have to cancel it because teams couldn't had to break protocols. They couldn't listen to what's set up. It's it's just um it's not right, and the NFL needs to step down and hand out these these punishments. Yeah, you're right. I, I'm with you completely on that. You know, when you start hearing about how Cam Newton and Gilmore had supper together after yeah. Cam Newton had a positive test, I know one of them had family members dispute some of that. I don't know for sure, but if, if that's what's going on, if they were getting together like that, yeah, I'd punish them. Make them have to truly sit out a few games as a player. You know, find the team, take draft picks away, let them know this is – this is serious. If we're going to get through this season, if we're actually going to have an NFL season that, that counts. They got to start yeah. making better decisions on some of this. Uh, so yeah. we, we, we shall see. Gio comes in with a $10 donation. Thank you, Gio. He says, been going through it a lot lately with thing we shall not mention. And now severe blood clots are taking a day to day and showing my support. Thank you all for your kind words and words, family. Hey, Gio, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your donation, especially with everything you're going through. Yeah. Um, want you to know that we're all thinking and wishing you a, about you and th- wishing you a speedy recovery with everything and hope you come through this better on the other side. Um, right. And again, we are very, it's very awesome to see you here in the chat while you're doing with all that. Right. All right. Get better, man. Just get, get better. Right. I think this is one of the, the coolest things about being a part of mile high huddle is getting to make connections with people like geo and, and getting to, to see things beyond just the football life actual real life you know yeah. you and i've talked about it of just uh getting to know each other through all this we don't we have we've never actually met in person <laughs> but you're still a close friend of mine that i you know i know cares deeply about me and i care deeply about you and your family and you know same with a lot of you in the chat just really appreciate you guys uh being a part of all this and uh geo yeah get better man and appreciate that yeah you, you're taking the time even in all the chaos to to come tune in and and hang out with us and before we get out of here, just just on this on that note is it, it really is. I mean, when I started doing this, what six seven years ago, I can't remember exactly how long it is. Um, at a at a site called Pro Football Spot, I, I never imagined what Mile High Huddle has become. I'm granted it wasn't Mile High Huddle then. We went over. I fo- I followed Chad to predominantly Orange. I was there for a little bit, and then we got a shot with. Um, I can't remember what it, what the name of the company was, and thus Mala Huddle was born. And it, it's it's been a lot of hours. It's been sometimes literal blood, sweat, and tears just putting into it, and um, j- just this connection that's been made. Um, I mean, doing this is I met my daughter's godfather. Um, I met people that I consider family, uh, and then of course all of you guys who sit here and support our work. I mean. It, it, it's very humbling and we are very appreciative of all the, of all your guys' support um, reading our articles, sharing our, our videos, our articles, donating, buying merch, all, all that. I mean, we're very supportive of it. it. It's very awesome. And Benley, it wasn't two, four, seven when we first started. Um, I, I want to say it was scout media is what it was. Um, I, I, I think that sounds right. And then eventually scout media, some happened, and they were we, we ended up merging with two four seven. Um, yeah, it's been it's been a long time. It's and again, I just it's it's so humbling and just trying to gather all my thoughts here. And <laughs> it's it's been a long road. It's been a fun road, and I'm yep. I'm looking forward to meeting more people through this. I mean, yep. every day there's I see new people in the chat every time I, I'm on here, and it's always great seeing new people. It's it, meeting new people through Twitter. Um, <laughs> yeah casey coming in here literal blood what are you guys doing behind the scenes fight club or something okay so you know like paper cuts i handle a lot of paper i mean all my notes <laughs> and stuff is all into notebooks i don't know i can't tell you how many times i've given myself paper cuts like yeah it's just <laughs> and and yes editing sessions they are absolute you want to punch a hole through a wall sometimes yes <laughs> <laughs> it's editing sessions are are a pain yes. um but but we love every second of it all, all the paper cuts all the all the blisters from writing um 
the long hours during draft season. It just we love it all, and honestly, I can't think of I can't think of anything better to be doing or that I would have been doing. Uh, just there, there's not many places that you can go do and um, be able to have a voice like we're given. Yeah, and just just, just have fun with it. Right. So, again, thank, and, thank you all for that. Right. So yeah, and getting to talk about something that's just fun that we're yeah. passionate about. And, uh, and then we get to, you know, make fun of the Patriots, uh, you know, Broncos winning 53 to zero. I hope that's exactly what we see The I hope the Broncos are absolutely fired up with everything the Patriots have put them through these last couple of weeks. And, uh, then we can come back here and celebrate together. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, not just making fun of the Patriots, making fun of the Raiders, the Chargers, <laughs> the Chiefs, every yes. other team out there, because there's only one team that matters and that's the Broncos. Um, so before we get out of here, Carl, if this game is played on Sunday, what what's your prediction for it? So I I really do think the Broncos are pretty fired up. Just listening to the players, I think that they're going to come out with with something a little bit extra in this one. I uh, I think the Broncos come out with a victory. I think they find a way to get something done, make a couple plays, make Cam Newton a little bit uncomfortable back there. They are the number one run defense in football right now, according to PFF. And I, that's exactly what the Patriots want to do. They want to run it at you. I really wish they could have got Draymond Jones and and Walker back for this one, just to add some more, yeah. more depth there. But beyond that, I still think they're going to be able to hold their own. And I, I see the Broncos winning this one. Uh, I'll go, I'll go 27, 27 to 20. What about you? I'm, I'm actually with you is um, I think the biggest difference for me isn't Drew Locke coming back. It's Philip Lindsay. Mm-hmm. I think there's definitely a, a fire under him coming back from his injury. And then of course, everything happening with Melvin Gordon. Um, and I, I think that he's looking at this as his chance to step up shine and show the Broncos, hey, you should have just rolled with me. You shouldn't have got Gordon. I should have been your guy. And I think he's going to bring a lot of fire and energy to this offense. And I think Drew Locke coming back is going to bring a lot of fire and energy to everyone else. I mean, and Philip Lindsay too. I mean, his his energy is so infectious. Yeah. I think we're going to see the offensive line look better. And I think it's going to be because of Drew Locke. And I think that they'll walk away with a win. And I'll, I, I think it'll be... I'll go 31, mm, 31-27. Okay. That's a, that's a pretty good day for the offense there. Yeah. I'll take it. Uh, I mean, I, again, I, Phil <laughs> Lindsay, Drew Locke. I, yeah. Possibly Fant. Yeah. I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> All right, guys. We got to get going. But before we do, of course, always make sure you guys are following us at Carl Dumbler, MHH, and at Eric Trickle. Make sure you guys are also following the pod, the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast at DVDD underscore pod. Make sure you guys are also following the mothership of all of our broadcasts and articles and everything at Mala Heddle. Make sure you can check out huddleuppod.com. Get some merchandise, some awesome stuff there, some hats, some shirts. The Dove Valley Deep Diver stuff is the best, so make sure you guys get that. And then if you guys can't afford anything with everything going on right now, definitely understand but you guys can still help support the show. Subscribe, like, and share. Um, it, it helps in multiple ways, more than one, just three simple tasks. So make sure you guys are doing that. So thank you guys all for joining us. We will be back next week. I don't know if Lance will be back next week or not. Um, if he isn't, it may be Carl, maybe a surprise, maybe not even me. We don't know. <laughs> I haven't figured out yet. I haven't thought that far ahead yet. But anyways, thank you guys for joining us. So, And as always, and have a wonderful weekend and go Broncos. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.